Anan Harsh, AMA Hello, my name is Anan Harsh, or Chef Dizzy, it's been a wild few days and it seems there's a lot of news, misinformation, conspiracies, and a lot going on about my existence right now. I'm sure many of you are curious about who I am and how I got here. I haven't had a very average life, and I'm sure to a lot of people my beliefs, lifestyle, and actions that have many will judge and consider immoral. But the truth is I have a dream, a story, and a perspective I'd like to share, for whoever it may touch and help. I believe in five things, peace, harmony, freedom, love, and happiness. I truly believe this is something human existence can reach, but unfortunately greed and corruption has pulled us far away from that dream. And the consequences of such as impacting individuals across the globe daily. But first, I would like to send out love and empathy for the family of the victims. Unheard of in this town and absolutely horrendous. I can't say I have ever lost a family member but in many parts of my life I had to grow or survive in harsh environments and I have lost several close friends and some I consider family. Many others are missing or probably never to be seen again at one many points in my life I was on my way to be one of them. Meditating on the murders and the suffering brings me to tears sometimes daily. One day returning from work I brought my neighbors some wine when they were having a small fire party outside just to meet them. Although it was a short visit I remember how beautiful, friendly, kind, and joyful they were. So happy it instantly brightened up my day. I remember going inside and having an inspired, long, and sick flow before stretching and drilling. Kaylee were the neighbors you wanted on Greek Row, partying is expected, to imagine someone wanting to hurt them is beyond disbelief and so sick. Several days ago when I thought I was over the sadness of losing those who only brought positive thoughts to me, when I went to check my mail I saw the posting of their faces and started crying. I was listening to Fallen Soldiers by Cormega, Wu-Tang represent, and starting thing not only of the recent murders but all the friends I lost and continued crying for hours. I went to work three hours later, tears still pouring from my face, trying to stay calm for my work duties. I could barely talk and our grill cook could tell something was up but I didn't know how to verbalize the feeling of losing a friend almost every other year. A feeling where you can't focus on anything but the suffering of losing a loved one, the energy burning you and you like a fire causing cuts, I'm mainly a prep cook, to be lighting speed but sloppy, I remember almost cutting myself using the anger, sadness, and other emotions to propel my movements. Remembering the kindness of those now gone, and, in this case, who had such a bright, happy, and free future. Kaylee, Zana and her boyfriend, those are the only three I remember but I know all are amzing, were real as human beings. To lose them is such an incredulous lose. I hope the family members find comfort in grief, and heal fully with time, positive prayers, and thoughts. And encourage them to try and spend their time on whatever activity brings them joy and or comfort, and, from my hippie roots, to try and spend time with nature, as it heals all wounds. While I don't normally support police, I understand them and do think there are some really well-intentioned and good ones in the force as I have met a few. And in this case I do support the homicide department and hope the perpetrator is found and justice is served. While I believe in freedom there is a line you do not cross, and once you cross that line it is time to move on to the next physical existence. I hope the family members and close relatives can find peace no matter what the outcome becomes. I have faced many near-death experiences, I've lived a reckless life, especially in my youth. I've done pretty much WE I want my entire life. At the same time I have always believed in compassion, morality, ahimsa, and being the best version of yourself. I have had a lot of struggles with insecurities incredibly naive and optimistic, and extremely different and lots of times misunderstood. Sometimes when I think about those I lost I ask myself why not me, but I know that's stupid and while I'm not really religious I do believe in purpose and destiny. Being here, free, 
and alive today despite many odds, I truly believe I have something to offer to the world, and I looking at what's happening globally and it brings me to tears to see how much suffering sentient beings are chronically experiencing. I have a story to share, and I think it's one that can touch people in meaningful ways and raise awareness of a lot of the problems in the world that many people do not see. Hopefully this will reach out those who can use or those just curious, it and make positive meaningful changes in this world. But before we go further I'd like to share a meditation I personally have found very powerful in my healing process. I couldn't find the book but it is from Tibetan Heart Yoga. It is a book my mother gave me that I took for granted and let slip my gaze, for almost a decade. Growing up homeschooled up to high school I had a very different youth than most people in this country. I was very close to my mother but grew distant over the years. My mother faced a lot of suffering and death in her life as well, her mother died in her only twenties, and had a deep respect for all life, which is sacred, nature, and compassion, which eventually was inherited in my life. She always had a high focus on meditation, yoga, healthy local cooking, and being at peace. It was the respect and desire to be in harmony with all living things in nature, and following her ideals, no matter the social status and monetary consequences, that saved my life over and over. With that said, there are two parts, part two is only to be done after a successful one. It used to be easy for me but I have not been as consistent with my practice and rarely do I ever make it part two these days. When I do, it usually brings me to tears. Part 1 The perfect 10 sit on a pillow or the floor, whichever is more comfortable in a hold for 15 minutes. Direct your spine as if someone is pulling you up through the top of your string, slightly tilt the chin down, relax the shoulders, palms up on knees uncentered on hips. Relax the rest of the body while staying erect in the spine, on the end of an exhale pull your stomach in. Engaging your core creating your adhyana. Preferably with your eyes closed, or mostly shut, relax your mind and just concentrate on your breathing. The more experienced well practiced, practice makes permeant not perfect, the longer your breath will be. The longer your breath is the less you will feel stress, anxiety, and worry. But for now allow a few normal breaths and observe. Now it is time to start. Count rounds of breaths up to 10 with 5 to 10 seconds each inhale and 5 to 10 seconds, even though. If any thought crosses your mind start over. When you reach 10 you move on to part 2 part 2 take a flow that is familiar to you. Most American choose a rose, whereas in Tibet the most common is a lotus. Now imagine a brilliant white diamond shining with radiant golden light that expands beyond your physical self. Now take all of your negative energy and envision it into a black point hole. On the inhale slowly pull it towards your golden flower radianting light from the brilliant shining white diamond and the scent. On your exhales expand the energy emitting from the flower. Eventually the negative energy mass will be very close to your flower, use your mind to focus on the radiating light and in one inhale pull the black mass into the center where the brilliant shining diamond eats it like a sun and uses it to expand more light from the gold flower now that your light is more brilliant and expansive, it's time to think about someone you care deeply about who is suffering. Imagine them sitting in front of you with their own diamond and flower, the the light is dim and the diamond is barely an ember. Yet something is wrong, you can tell they are not feeling well, and can sense and see their sadness. Your own flower and diamond are shining bright still and envision this. Think about their struggles and what brings them suffering, go deep and into detail and without judgment. Think about their struggles, the sacrifices they have to make to overcome them, and the many ways human existence brings them suffering from society to personal health. Now envision all the negative energy and factors that cause them suffering and suck it like a black hole into one black mass. Now slowly start sucking it on your inhales out of their body. When it comes out, you can see some of their sadness leave their body and face, but you can still see it is not all removed, as you both still sense the negative energy mass. 
At the same time some spark sets to the shining diamond and the golden flower begins to radiate more light. Now keep moving the mass towards you, eventually it will be close to your golden flower, try to use around 7-8 breaths total to get here. Now focus on your radiating light, how intense it is from your diamond, consuming everything around it but this mass. Now again with one breath, pull it in and allow your diamond to eat it and shine the most brilliantly it has ever shown. Finally the happiness of your loved one returns to her face and body, you can feel her problems being lifted and see the light return to her face as her flower glows strongly as the shining diamond grows in intensity. Now that both your flowers are bright and radiating expansive brilliant light, imagine your diamonds emitting a beam of golden light creating a concentrated ball of energy in the middle. Using 10 breaths, grow it in mass and intensity until the 10th breath where mass explodes and creates a brilliant golden light the most bright and intense it's been as it consumes everything. Spend as many breaths here envisioning the omnipresent light. Try to start with at least three and then work your way up. There are reports of people spending days in this trance state. A lot of information and misinformation has been dug up about me, and a lot of false media as well. The initial media came from a dope fiend but hurt and I'd like to share my version and set the record straight. It said my car was used in a robbery, my car was in a fucking mechanic shop at the time. Twelve years ago I was charged with second robbery with a stolen firearm, felony possession of mushrooms, MDMA, meth, and opiates I think. All charges were dropped, rightfully so and I went to prison for possession with intent to deliver of MDMA. I'd like to share what happened and how I got there. Growing up I was a very gifted student that was able to excel with putting minimal time into activities, I found myself with a lot of free time. As a teen I didn't really know what I wanted to do nor did I have any concrete sense of purpose destiny. I was a bit of an outcast socially but also very mature but also very childlike, in my youth and I ended up hanging with much older people. I was dating a 21-year-old at the age of 16. Getting weed was hard back then, I remember it always taking a long time, quality half the time was ass, and your bags were pinched or stolen sometimes. I ended up knowing some people so started hooking my friends up. After a while I was tired of all the bullshit of second man shit and I felt like I could do it better. I partly did it to support my own weed habit, I partly did it cause I was tired of seeing my friends and I ripped off all the time. I'm a believer in freedom and Einstein, and in particular I believe the government should not play the role of a mother. People have to learn how to make their own decisions and I believe all drugs should be legal so there is a safer and fairer space when it comes to substance. This would not only create purer safer drugs, it would also make them cheaper, and the people addicted to such substances wouldn't feel so alienated and would be more inclined to seek the help they need. The way alcohol is not treated as a drug socially but substances like MDMA that while mostly party drugs also have clinical users are treated like the devil. A few of my friends would have get togethers every few months and have a rave, MDMA back then was sketchy as fuck. It was another market I wanted to change for my community. We were all paying 20 25 30 a pill and not always knowing what we were getting. So I bought a testing kit and started doing shit myself again. I probably would have made a lot of money but instead I would do things like buy an ounce of weed and smoke it in a night with a group of 20 people. I was on probation for drinking at high school football game and on curfew. So on weekends I would wait for curfew lady to call twice, then I would climb out window, get ride to town, take a bus to the west side, and get back in time for school on Monday. One weekend a lot happened and when I got back I was napping at a homie's place when I was woken up. Some opiate fiend came in to buy some shit, saw a couple rolls, 100 ecstasy pills, a quap of weed, picked it up, and ran out the door. My friends told me this dude took a bunch of pills but they know where he lives from a mutual friend. 
At the time a couple people in our group started smoking meth and ended up getting some crazy tweaker shit from them, one of them a gun. I wanted no part in it so I did my best to stay out of that field. I had morals and rules, and meth definitely went past what I could believe in and was comfortable with. Yet I also stayed out of what wasn't my business. Anyways since they woke me up from a nap I felt they and I should do something about to. I happened to know someone there who I smoked oxy with a few times back in the day and so I knew this person. I walked up to the back door and pretended I was fiending for opiates. The dude said he could get some but it was 120, I would never pay over 80 back then, but I was like sure, so he let inside and we waited. I saw the rolls I had picked up on the rest side that weeked on the table and the quap of weed. I didn't know he stole the weed or I would pick that up too. I picked up the rolls and ran for the back door. He followed and tried to stop me so with the rolls clutched in my hand I started bashing on his head with my fist until he let go, his friend was right there. I remember looking at him expecting him to try and help him, but I think he knew what was up so he put his hands out and was like I'm good I ain't beef with you bro. So I opened the back door and left. This piece of shit followed and jumped on me from behind and I called for backup. My two friends came running from the parking lot and held him back, knowing how he snitched and lied to the police to us when he wasn't even looking at getting arrested sometimes I think about how I should beat the shit out of him. But as a pacifist I had the drugs, so we left. The neighbors heard a commotion and called the cops. We tried to throw everything from the house in the car and go out the side parking lot but we missed a turn and our of our teammates said something he shouldn't and the police got probable cause. And then we all got fucked as the this dude happened to have a medical marijuana license and said we showed up trying to steal his medical marijuana that he also stole from us. They found the stolen pistol and boom second robbery. A part of me wishes I did shoot this piece of shit and left. But karma's a bitch and life goes on and I don't have much luxury to spend a lot of times with thoughts like that. I was in county for a week, they wanted a speedy trial after they found out I didn't rob this dude with a pistol and offered me two weeks for felony possession of marijuana. My lawyer advised me to wait, the 16 year old dumbass to me knew better and to take the two weeks but I listened to my lawyer to try and get all the felonies off my records and I ended up doing a year instead. Looking back what a fucking a joke. In prison I learned how to shoot up, as well as how to be humble and grateful. It's quite sad that the people who struggle, usually from environmental, mental, and biological factors, who need the most help and mentorship, are given the most neglect. Many had abusive meth-addicted parents with no financial stability and eventually through suffering and neglect they fall into the same footsteps and do unthinkable things. The fact most of our society still lives on the laws our government has been feeding us for decades about drugs, the systematically way lowest income bracket populations and minorities are demographically contained in ways that make it hard to get out of poverty, violence, and drug abuse in their communities is heartbreaking to me. When I got out I didn't really have any plans because I didn't think I would make it past the age of 20 to 24. I did drugs heavily usually recitation ally, but after prison I didn't started developing more addictive personality traits and became a bit more estranged. I started getting into speedballs and at one point in my life I was having an OD almost every every other month. I remember one time taking three shots of whiskey then a speedball on top and then waking up but naked with my friends giving me CPR in the shower. Having friends like these was something I'm eternally grateful for cause in most similar environments that isn't always likely to happen. Spending a lot of time driving and on desolate roads I got really comfortable at driving fast. I worked my way up to 110-120 miles per hour and wanted to do more but my car couldn't go faster. I was usually going over 30 on speed limits on any given day, any given time. I almost drove off the bridge going into Seattle hitting some black ice and a few other times I thought I was done for good but have somehow managed to still be living. 
After I was released I went from 130 pounds to 180-ish. I fasted for 3 days and went vegan, I was vegetarian up to the age 18. At some point before going to prison for a second time I decided just to run, I was living in a community in the mountains at that point and didn't see why I would leave or something would happen. But this dude came by to go up to Hempfest and we slept in a pocket that night and the police came and saw I had a warrant for dealing MDMA and I got deported back to WA. The Hempfest before that I ended up parking my car in the wrong spot where it got towed and I dropped for hits of acid of some random strangers for some weed and I while I was walking there was this homeless dude who asked me for some money for some food. I was like I got food but no money and starting reaching for some organic snacks I had but he was all angry and said I don't want your garbage. I was really taken about growing up in my small ass community with no homeless people but I realized I had never been homeless or in his situation so I couldn't really judge him. So walking around listening to Aesop Rock I decided I should see what it's like living without a stable source of shelter and food so I hopped a train and rode it trying to get as far away from civilization as possible. At some point I hopped off and was walking on the tracks in a beach in a forest. Not too long I noticed a plump Asian lady in a beautiful house with all almost all see-through windows looking it out. I had not succeeded but I still felt peace. My goal was to walk until I no longer felt an inch of greed in my body and only peace. So I fasted, walked, and lit a fire on the tracks using it as a blanket for the night. I remember reading a book in prison called The Moneless Man and it has motivated me to this very day. It's about a dude who sources all the problems of the world to money and the only way to be the solution is to stop using it. But being reasonable and resourceful he raised a thousand ish in cash to get a tent, water, sourced food from co-ops that had to throw up food after certain dates but were still good usually for a bit after, biked everywhere built his thing away from town and did it for like three months. After realizing how much he liked it he wanted to make plans later to do it for a prolonged period of time. At some point after a few days I remember reaching my goal looking at a tree feeling and also while breathing in the winds looking towards on the water on the tracks and being able to feel every electrifying sensation of the wind throughout my whole body. I remember the feeling so good for a moment I glimpsed the thought of suicide knowing that once I re-entered civilization and society I would never be able to experience something as satisfying. I think as we grow though there's always new realizations that allow us to reach new peaks. When I returned I realized there were many others like me out here by choice. I never stopped and carried a sign I remember as if by God everything was provided. One time I was just walking down Seattle and this couple walking out of a restaurant looked at me with a box of high in cuisine and stopped me and said hey you need this more than us and eating the most yummy Asian noodles in my life. Others showed me where non-profit kitchens were in and taught me how to survive. Only the first few days were hard. At some point I ran into some anarchist and squatted up for like a week. Eventually I was braiding some hemp at a QFC and this dude who had been eating there for a while looked at me and was like yo, you want a place to stay? And I was like sure. We walked to Fremont from Capitol Hill and he lived in a dope ass place with every type of book of learning you could imagine. I spent my time there landscaping one of his projects he wanted to do and reading his books. We met his friends and they were cool and introduced me to the Dalai Lama not in real life. Another one of the books my mother got me was called How to Expand Love by the Dalai Lama. As a kid it seemed really corny but as grew older I became to realize how powerful of a book it was along with Buddhism and the Dalai Lama. Throughout the years I became a big follower and spent most of my teen reading and meditation on his concepts, however imperfect of an individual I am. I also came to realize that that dude on the street was just a hater and I should pay people that that no mind. Which brought me a lot of peace as I rejoined society in an effort to help alleviate it of its suffering with whatever wisdom, skills, and teachings I could offer. I don't know if it was the best decision but I believe or tell it to make me feel better that everything happens for a reason.
I had warrants. I met my family in Seattle, went home and served my times. Although I wonder what my life would be like if I had stayed living in Seattle trying to learn and grow as much as possible. During one of my re-ups my connect gave me tour of Seattle and I ended up randomly buying this book by Bikram called Bikram Yoga at this hippie shop downtown. I only read up to the warm-up series but this is one of the books and disciplines that have given me the tools of safe passage almost all my life. He talks about Americans and their problems and how the body and mind needs to be maintained like a car. The right way is the hard way. I religiously did the warm-up series in their entirety along with the Tibetan heart yoga, the meditation and there is some poses after. The potency of its effects on my happiness, mood, health, and well-being were undeniable and I ended up dedicated a big portion of my life to yoga. At many times it was my only tool of survival in many of the constrained and restricted environment I had to learn how to grow in while everyone around me was drowning. But I was also really about the festival life, I grew up very connected to art and music, and the scenes I saw there were always where I wanted to be. I was at a festival one time yelling Molly and ended up selling some to a guy that a cop saw. I was small timer. I had less than a gram and less than $150 on me. I ended up going to prison for another year this time I wanted to refocus on my art and life since it was becoming more and more apparent I wasn't going to die when I thought. Years of surviving made me thrive to build a sustainable and healthy life for myself. I applied and went to Evergreen State Setup. Orientation was the week after I got out of prison for the second time. I went for fine arts and did music and dance composition. I ended up learning how much I loved shooting up coke and found access and started getting addicted to 4 coke. I met another girl very similar to me who also loved to shoot up coke, but mostly opiates. I left a bunch of drugs and money at her place right there but days later it wasn't stolen and she returned it. When we found out that each other was a trustworthy person that still had beliefs and values despite shooting up a lot of drugs, we became very close and started hanging out all the time cause that was a rare ass quality. I remember loving being over there cause of her positive attitude, we would shoot up and stay up for like 3-4 days, I never felt bad withdrawals or come downs just cause she was so fun and pleasant to be around. We would sometimes sleep for 25 hours straight, I had to take UAs every week so we'd go hard, sit through our come downs withdrawals, go to school during the week, get our shit down, and then do it all over. Absolute insane lifestyle but I felt like we made it our pretty good all things considering. I remember when I would eventually walk to my house, I lived downtown she lived towards campus, it was like a four mile walk and I remember walking over the bridge looking over the water with an unimaginable feeling of fatigueless, but finding some comfort in the water and stairs until I made it to long ass steps that led up towards Capitol Way. I think a lot of people think I spent my youth in a den shooting up bunch of drugs. But this isn't true I only did that a few several times a month. My preferred activity was to eat 5 grams of mushrooms or 4 tabs of acid put on some Aesop rock, and go 10 plus mile walks. It wasn't until college that I started doing hard drugs over psychedelics. Sometimes after my UA I would preload 10 coke shots, and shoot up in the bathroom every 20 minutes during class. I was in a poetry class so it was pretty dope, I take a fat ass shot, then go to class and write a bunch of poetry. In all honestly it was pretty dope one time on my way to my dealer's house on campus another girl that I didn't hang out with much wanted to tag a lot. I got some coke, she got some heroin, and we went to her place on campus to bang it up. She took hers, I took mine, then dropped my needle cap out the window. I went outside to grab it and tried to come back in. No answer. Knocked again, her roommate came and let me in. I didn't see her so I went to the kitchen. She was on the floor with foam bubbles coming out of her mouth. I always thought being around death wouldn't faze me after all I've been through. But I felt her pulse and couldn't find it or her breathing and my heart and panic levels shot up to 10,000. 
I also had just took a 0.12 gram sheen shot. I remembering wanting nothing more than for her to live. I dragged her to the bathroom. Grabbed all the illicit shit I saw in my cursory glance, threw it in my backpack, and gave it to Tay first person I knew outs die. They didn't know I shot up but were pretty cool about the situation. It was like 10 seconds total of me opening the door, seeing a friend, and like yo I need you to take this ASAP. I went back inside and started running cold bath water on her. Wasn't really working due to awkwardness of space so I re-evulated and started pumping her chest and giving mouth to mouth. Her roommate came in and asked if she should call the cops. I said I don't know, and she was like, I'm calling the cops and I was like okay. About a minute later I had her breathing again and a huge feeling of relief. Please don't call the cops she said as knock came on the door and I'm like they already here. Girl never took our her fentanyl wash earlier that day in her spoon she used to shoot up the heroin she got from my dealer's house and instantly owed. Normally in Washington in these situations you're protected by something called the Good Samaritan Act, but they don't do laws on Evergreen Campus they bypassed it and kicked us both out of school. The biggest thing that happened to me at Evergreen though was Circus Club. A super amazing, super cute girl pulled me aside one day to teach me some hoop tricks then beguiled me into Circus Club where I discovered contact staff and instantly fell in love. I remember at a festival time high on acid seeing some dude do some fire contact staff and thinking it was the dopest shit ever. We met three hours a day three days a week so that's where I started my drilling. Eventually I bought my own sticks and used my progression and practice to kick my coke use. I got deep into my practice and healed a lot of my past wounds and trauma. At some point in my life I realized you couldn't just do drugs as they are not an activity in and of themselves. After I got kicked out of Evergreen I started going to school online, gathering some equipment, and making hip-hop music. I had rules when I did shot up coke eventually, I had to be creating art or music while I was high. So I'd set up everything, put on some beats, take a fatty shot, then rap over them. At some point the coke took control and I found myself spending hours searching the floor instead of making music. That was when I realized I had a problem and had to cut myself off cause there was no excuse to do drugs and search your carpet instead creating something worthwhile. I was living at home spending all my time practicing contact staff and yoga. Two-ish years later I undertook 200 yoga teacher training and started teaching yoga. The training had unreal effects on me. I kicked habits I struggle with for almost a decade in a month, and became one of the best versions of myself. Eventually I had a bad breakup, got really depressed, and started shooting up heroin and coke against and my life slowly started slipping apart again. I had to stop teaching yoga and eventually cut ties with studio I was at. Through my desire to stop my recent depression I got a job as a dishwasher at a local fine dining breakfast joint. I remember loving every second. The first catering we had I shot up a bunch of boke before going through work and was stressing the owners would see my track marks, I brought some coke and capsules to swallow so I wouldn't go through withdrawals at work. I remember having so much fun even when coming down I completely forgot about the capsules and before I knew it the night was over and I was feeling good. Back then I knew I had a problem so I would only buy a half G at a time, and I would do it right before my dealer went to bed so I couldn't get any more after it was gone. Eventually my passions took priority and most distractions took a back seat. The main one being coke. I found myself with a lot of time, a lot of money, for me, I probably spent about 600 week on shooting up coke back then, and a lot of energy and passion. I worked up from singles to triple staff, financed a new hybrid and got my own apartment, over 100 applications to get one, over 600 to get a job, life as a felon. I slowly moved up my way at work to prep, then pantry, then flat. Then I was being trained on Expo in Saudi before I got hit by a truck as a pedestrian that fractured three of my ribs and put me out of work for eight-ish months. 
I never fully recovered and with COVID happening right after took a huge hit to my career goals. I got a 17k settlement but I feel it's minuscule to the negative impact it had on my life. As I grow older I'm learning I have a desire to pass along what has helped me in life to others around me. On the night of the murder I'm sure there's some discrepancies. First, I got home a little late cause I was talking to one of my co-workers after work. When I went home it was pretty normal, I made some tea, did some drills, and I think played a game of lol. I went to bed and heard nothing out of the ordinary. When the cop knocked on my door next day and asked if I heard untying I was like no, nothing unusual, I didn't, t no there was a murder so small deals like a faint scream in the distance, one of my neighbors getting home, closing their car door, closing their front door, etc. were not on my mind. I noticed I was quoted as heard a screaming. This is not true. I heard a scream, faint and party like to my half asleep eyes. To be clear there's probably at least five screams every Saturday. Even on dead nights you'll probably hear at least someone making loud sounds at some point. Small detail but in this situation I think screaming and a scream and very different and small details matter like this with all the internet sleuths and conspirators around. Some of you are wondering what stick juggling is and I'd love to share. I'm at a point in my practice where I will start offering services, fire shows and lessons, and I'm gonna start a free YouTube channel on learning fundamentals along with a cooking show if you'd like to see more about what's going on in my life I'd love it if you stayed tuned. I actively avoid social media but I have a public IG staff junkie that I haven't updated in years cause I'm lazy when it comes to video uploading and editing but I will work to add some more recent videos of what I've been doing with triples, I mostly work towards for right now. And with that we can begin the AMA. PSI Applegiv for the rough editing on the second half I've been writing this up for several hours and will try to edit update more later.